Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to this presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Marcelo Bacher. Um, I work at Applied Materials Algorithm uh, Developer and uh, Applied Materials Israel. And what we'd like to show you in this presentation is uh, part of the work that we are uh, conducting in the, the scope of semiconductors. But before, uh, before that, we'll start a little bit with uh, what Applied Materials is. Um, what we do, maybe um, not of all of you know what uh, Applied Materials does uh, here in Israel or worldwide. Um, actually, Applied Materials is the, is the world's first provider of equipment for the semiconductor industry. Specifically, uh, they provide equipment to develop of chips of semiconductors, chips that you use usually in your phones, cars, uh, screens, and whatever. Uh, I would say that there is almost no component in the world that wasn't spotted or created by one of the machines of uh, Applied Materials. Uh, it's located headquarters in, uh, in California and over the year, the last year uh, invested or around two billion dollars in, um, in research or development for creating the innovations that, uh, that we do. Uh, beside the headquarters in California, the second uh, biggest place of research and development and for in innovation, it's located here in Rehoboth, um, in the uh, close to the uh, train station, close to the Weizmann Institute. Um, that's nice building, so you might want to visit us wherever you want. We'll be very happy. And uh, so, what we do? It's the next question. Um, there are two equipments, um, sort of. Yeah, two quick kind of equipments. One is the production of the chips, and the other of uh, is related to process diagnostics and control. What we do here in, in Applied Materials in Israel is to deal with the equipment that deals with measurement the process and seeing if we can find some defects along the uh, proce uh, um, process and development of the, of the chips. For example, on the left side, uh, we see, for example, for uh, 30 nanometers, uh, the effect uh, we have to spot it and also categorize what kind of defect is during the, the process. On the right side, we also measure some characteristics of the substructure uh, of uh, um, transistors, for example. Um, in this case, it's the path uh, that is uh, measured, which uh, can, of course, if it's a different thing that uh, could cause warm energy loss and malfunction of the chip. So we have also to measure uh, that kind of characteristics inform the customer uh, where this problem might, might be. Um, how hard can it be? Well, um, if you know this is a, a reproduction of a wafer. A wafer is a thin structure disk of uh, silicium. On, on, on top of this, you um, build your chips in these uh, squares. Um, layer after layer in a very complex uh, process, chemical process as well. And, and what you would like to find out is, for example, um, in a 40 nanometers picture, you would like to see uh, that you have here a problem, you have a defect. The wafer here is a 300 millimeters diameter. Um, so if we um, scaled out um, these measurements to the uh, world that we can measure with uh, rules. It's like finding an ant in Manhattan, the type of the ant, where it moves in 10 minutes. Um, so it's a challenge because we have to do it really, really fast. So uh, how we do that? Uh, one of the equipments that we develop here is um, it's an uh, um, uh, optical microscope that scans the whole wafer um, around 10 minutes, generating millions of uh, pictures. And it's a microscope that actually is not so quite small, that fits usually in a nine square meter room, and it's con connected to a supercomputer where there all the magic happens. And in that case, for example, you find here 50 nanometers defect or scratch of 20 nanometers. And those pictures that we have uh, in here, they are very, very nice. Normally, this is not the case um, for other reasons that we will see now. And the reasons, or their reason actually, is that the design rule shrinks 
along the years. Why? Well, new features uh, would like to be integrated. Um, that's every year you get an, a new iPhone or Samsung or a new screen or new car. And all the features that you would like to you integrate, uh, you need a high integration uh, process. That means that the energy of the, uh, the alarms, the, the information that you get by scanning the, uh, the wafer, start to mix them up with the information relative of the, the, the critical information that we are, you would like to get through the process. So what was before that you can put a threshold and then you usually get all this information, the critical information that you, uh, you have to spot, right now it's a clear challenge. It's, uh, it's, quite, it's, it's not quite easy. So in order to uh, try to differentiate um, this, uh, this mix-up uh, elements uh, generated by the detection performance of the optical uh, inspection uh, equipment, you have to uh, go a little bit deeper into the, uh, the process with uh, another microscope, which is a high-resolution microscope. Uh, it's an electron beam microscope and, and it generates pictures with really high quality below the nanometer scale. And this kind of all images that you will see here, um, for example, from patterns or connections or strips or um, other type of, of uh, um, elements during the development of the, of the chip. The difference is the, uh, the optical inspection generates millions of pictures and, and really fast. And in this case, you, you can't use this device in order to measure the billions of points on the wafer because it will take uh, three weeks or a month. Uh, and, and you have a really strong uh, shrinkage in the time that you can use in the fab, in the semiconductor fab, in order to find out all those errors. So you can spend three weeks scanning one single wafer until you find something that's going wrong. So we have to balance between the amount of information or data that we get from um, fast scanning of wafer into this microscope that tells us exactly what's actually going on. In this framework is what we use the active learning. So we have here relative low resolution optical microscope which scans the full wafer and a couple of meters, mi uh, minutes, we should somehow generate sampling, to spot some, some elements, some features from, the, from, from these maps that it generated here. This guy tells us what's actually going on from the sample that, uh, the, that we get. From there, we make some learning in order to uh, generate some model and some prognostics what, what's actually happened on the full wafer without uh, having something that exactly by this guy. And after we build the model, so we ask ourselves, uh, should we reuse the model or should we collect new data? In the languages, should we exploit or should we explore? And this is the trade-off and this, these three guys is exactly what we have to find a strategy in order to collect the data in a more optimal way so we can uh, supply the customer with uh, what's going on the wafer with a little, little amount of data. So in the area of active learning, okay, we have the data. We have to develop some sampling again. There is an oracle, which in this case is the SAM, uh, this uh, high resolution device. We learn a model and we go again and try to sample more data until we are sure that the data that we have it's enough or the budget it's over. All this process should be less than an hour. Um, so we have to be really fast and we have to really be optimal in the way the samples that we look into the, the space. So how we do that? Okay, given the data that at the beginning of the, of the time it's uh, completely unlabeled, so we separate it in several jars, in several clusters, somehow. Let's suppose that every jar has different uh, number of uh, elements. And at the beginning, we just don't know what happens on, on each of these jars. So the question is, OK, we have, in this case, five clusters. There are several balls. At the beginning, they are all gray. 
and which one should we choose and how many? We have a limited budget, which means uh, time, right? We don't, we can't just take all the, the stuff and go into the SEM and say, okay, let's go back in 10 uh, months. So we have to do it really fast. So the idea is to build a method that gives us the, all the green balls, which is the information that we would like to get from the feature space, but also the, uh, identify where actually it doesn't work to get uh, more balls. Uh, but also we have to uh, balance between uh, the information that might, we might get here through the other. We might get stuck on this jar and asking ourselves, okay, there is uh, just the information that we need, it's inside this bar. But actually we have also information spread in other jars, not in segments. So we have to think about a strategy which relates uh, trade-off between exploration and exploitation and sampling. And the framework that covers this, this kind of stuff is the so-called multi-armed bandits. Um, that the name it's, uh, refers to the uh, guy who enters a casino with uh, 100 bucks in the pocket and will let you get a lot of money from this 100 bucks. So he can't use all the 100 bucks once. He may start switching among the machines, identifying one that gives the best reward, the best amount of money based on the investment that he did. And that way it's a bandit because you lose all the time, but that's the way it is. So the guy has to do an exploration exploitation. Uh, it's an online optimization because every time you go and play, you would like to make the reward, the maximize the reward, which means in our case to find out the red ball, the green balls. Yet, in our case, we don't want to stick with one jar that we see here. We don't want to stick to this one. We want to cover all the jars. So, besides this, we have a limited budget of time. So, we can't just take one at a time. We have to uh, cover most of the jars at the same time. So, in the literature, it's called multiplay multi armed bandits. And because there is a shrinkage of the budget, it's also you have the war budgeted. So you have a limited number of plays, you have a limited budget to play, and, but you have to play all around. So the question now is how you uh, handle the budget among all the charts. So that's here the octopus, also from the Wikipedia on the, on the sampling policy that we are uh, going to propose. There are several arms that, plays, that he plays at the same time, and that's exactly what we do. We would like now to ask uh, or develop a strategy to play, to take balls from different jars and we have to choose the amount of balls of each jar, of each jar in order to maximize our reward, identifying the, red, the green balls. So, how we uh, formulate the problem? We have a set of key arms, clusters. We labeled uh, the data set as a binary class put in a reward of one if we find the uh, green ball, or zero if we find the uh, gray one. We have a limited budget. We have 5,000 samples. And you have to think about that you get hundreds of millions of pictures, and you need to find 5,000 that will characterize what happens on the wafer, right? So that's uh, the, the challenge that we have. We have, uh, assuming a uh, Bernoulli distribution, because it's success or not success, so it's uh, automatically you, you will define that. And the goal is maximize the number of uh, samples for the target class, the green one, but we also would like to cover the, the, the all the jars. Because if we stuck with single one, we are get biased data, and then we can't do anything. We just spot on, on, on small portion of the, of the wafer or the feature map, and we don't get information what happens actually uh, around. So we have to cover, ma maximize also the coverage. If we go into the formalism, we define here a uh, reward. Uh, that is what we like to maximize. In the literature, you will see that's on the other side. We like to minimize the regret, which is actually easier from the, uh, from the optimization point of view, but we like to, in this case, to uh, optimize our reward by 
uh, we assume that there is a parameter which is the Bernoulli success criteria from the jar or the cluster. We have to find out how many balls for the arm or the for the arm of the jar k at time t we have to take. And these bo b balls we have to go then and sample them exactly on the high resolution microscope to get the type of information and the, the ball is, is whether green or is it gray. And this is the, the constraint, right? Uh, what IT here uh, represents the arms that we are going to sample, which at the beginning actually it's all, all, the, all the jars. But maybe at the time we will define that this chart doesn't, it's, it's, it's already enough information, we don't need to go inside, so we can put it aside and go to the other parts. Okay, so um, how is the proposed sampling? Uh, we define um, kind of a forks exploration because we want to maximize also the coverage. Um, this is actually uh, compatible with the active learning paradigm. We are spotting actually uh, the sampling strategy here. Uh, it's an NP-hard problem. It's a, a, it's a, the problem is um, combinatorial and we have to optimize over combinatorial uh, algorithms with np hard so we have to approximate it in a way. There is no closed form solution to this, uh, to this, to this problem. Um, we define that each cluster, arm, or jar is uh, distributed as Bernoulli, so automatically we define a prior distribution over the parameters of the Bernoulli as a beta distribution. Um, we are going to draw some value from this uh, posterior distribution that we are going to uh, estimate. Uh, that is the Thompson sampling. And after we get this uh, weight, we just multiply by the budget and get the number of balls that we like to get from each bar at time t. It's simple. So the algorithm, it looks like this. Um, we have t runs. Uh, this t goes actually related to the number of total numbers of the defects that we are to sample. Uh, we start by estimating the parameters of the empirical uh, uh, expect, um, uh, expectation reward from the jar, uh, which is this uh, mu, and also from the sigma. We would like also to estimate the variance um, using uh, the using the history of samples that we we got from from that uh, from that arm k up to time t. Um, we also define this force exploration. We need it in order to cover all the charts as much as we can. So we introduce another term in the optimization, which is a, a pure exploration model. That exploration model doesn't depend on the reward, but depends on the number of uh, balls or number of uh, samples that we get from each uh, segment. And it looks like this. Um, this is the number of uh, times, uh, the, the number of, of uh, samples that we get at each of the batch number of the iterations uh, from a, some, uh, some arm. And this is the reward. In this case, the reward we split in two. One reward goes, comes from the, um, from the performance of the, of the cluster. How much, how many uh, green balls we get over the number of balls that we got. In this case, the part of the reward that goes logarithmic descent with the number of, uh, of samples that we got from that sample, that means from the segment. That means if we explore too much a jar, at, at some time it doesn't work enough. We, have, we already have enough information, so we don't need it. So this part of the reward goes down. This is the Thompson sampling, where we get the, um, the parameters with the performance elements that we estimated from the previous step and then we compute uh, we compute the number of balls that we had to or the number of samples elements that we had to take from the k uh, at time uh, j actually uh, it should be t here but okay so you uh, you did notice and this is a function that actually bounds this uh, that combines the two weight elements in order to get the exact number of, of uh, samples that we will like to pull. And this eta is the factor that trades off between how much information, 
how much exploitation you would like to use and how much uh, exploration you would like to uh, use to get the number of, um, of samples. You pull the arms, that means you give these uh, samples to the uh, uh, high resolution microscope, you get the labels and you proceed to update your model. So, uh, simple um, synthetic experiment setting. We define 50, <coughs> 50 arms, each one with a different number of uh, samples going run from a uh, couple of below 100 to uh, 10,000 more or less. And this is the amount of green balls you we put inside uh, each jar in a completely uh, random uh, fashion. If uh, in, in three of them, we put a lot. So the idea here is to identify these three jars and also to cover as much as we can for the other uh, segments, jars, arms. Okay. On the uh, left side, we see also the results of on the synthetic data, uh, around 50 runs that we, we, we did. And what we have here is the cumulative reward uh, for different different value of this eta parameter from 0, 0, 3, 0, 7 and 1.0. And also we use a benchmark method known in the literature which was really close to the method that we have to, to use. It's completely based on the Thompson sampling uh, and but we know that for example the balls here means eta uh, equals 1, 0 means that it's completely based on exploitation. There's no exploration but from the sampling that we get through the Thompson sampling. And we know that in that case, both methods uh, go in into the almost on the, on the same value. The other surpasses the cumulative reward, uh, meaning that this exploration also helps for the coverage and also for the identification of the arms that actually gives uh, most of the green balls. On the right side, we see real data. I can say from where, but it's a cumulative uh, reward that we see here. Random sampling would mean eta uh, set to zero, which means that we take only exploration. We don't care what actually happens. We don't care how many green balls we get. We just do exploration. And we see here that for some, well, for, oh, for some values of e uh, eta, uh, we see a better, um, a, a better performance. In this case, uh, one zero means completely uh, exploration, exploitation, and it's much better than um, than the random sampling, of course. But also, if we if you add, if you, if you force the exploration, that you will get also the rewards from the other segments that you will have uh, put down because of the parameters of the performance. So we don't you don't kill this uh, each cluster that didn't get you uh, enough uh, green balls. You just keep them alive a little bit, and this little bit. It's the difference that you get from completely Thompson sampling to this uh, force exploration. Uh, I assume I didn't did it uh, here with the benchmark, but I, I assume that these these guys will uh, be actually close to the eta equal zero. This is the distribution of the samples for all the segments, which actually correlates with the uh, uh, information that that we get from the reward. In eta equal 1.0, we stick to the one of the segment of the cluster that gives a lot of uh, green uh, balls. With uh, 07, we, manage, we might manage, it, manage to identify the other two segments, the two clusters. And with green, it's completely random. So you see that you just sample uh, equally uh, um, over all the, uh, the, the clusters. So, um, conclusions. Uh, we uh, managed to do the active uh, learning and combine with uh, multi armed bandits in order to define a strategy for the for the sampling. Um, it's based on Thompson, uh, which also takes us to the uh, gives us a, mo uh, a lot of answers from the theoretical point of view. So we know that this converts into the logarithmic best point. Uh, five seconds already over. We have only one hyperparameter that you have to tune. And it's, it's really fast to implement, so you can also uh, cover the, uh, the expectation that this algorithm runs really fast. Uh, this is our website. You are welcome to visit. You can follow us. 
in LinkedIn, also on Facebook. And that's it. Thank you.